Ah, quelle bonne journée pour être français. Quels ce sont This video is sponsored by Skillshare, providing over 28,000 courses on a wide variety of topics. Stay tuned at the end of the video to hear more. Of all the mechanized combatants in World War II, the German Panzer Army is probably one of the most talked about and easily has had the most written on it out of all the tank forces of all the other combatants. There's something about German tanks that really captures the imagination of everybody who was into World War II, even from a young age. When I was a kid, back when the History Channel was basically the World War II channel, I remember always looking forward to the documentaries that would focus on German tanks. With all the discussion online, I've noticed that that seems to be pretty typical. The whole metric ton of books and media on it really seems to back this up to the point that the discussion on them has pretty much been done to death. I mean, even I have contributed a few nails to that coffin. I mention all of this because it would be impossible to cover absolutely everything that could be said about German tanks in this video while keeping it in the same tone of my other ones on different countries. So this video will be kind of brief, but if you want to read more for yourself, in the description I have a list of some of my favorite books and lectures on the subject. Alright, disclaimer over, let's get into it. Yes, get over it! Like, well, most other countries, Germany's experience with tanks began in World War I after they were sprung on them by the British, and their initial interest in the concept was rather small. After getting over the initial shock and hurriedly placing orders for their own designs, the Germans very quickly figured out that the things were not all that scary once you figured out how to kill them, causing the German tank program to take a back seat to more pressing projects. And with resources being tight, only a handful of German models were produced in the form of the A7V in two super heavy K wagons that began construction but were not completed before the war's end. Once the war was finished and the German army was reduced to only 100,000 men under the Versailles Treaty, German generals got together and began discussing what happened, why they lost, and what needed to be changed. After an early assessment that was quickly deemed inaccurate of a French-style defensive doctrine for the future, the German army decided that in the closing years of World War I, they had actually pretty much gotten the correct concept for modern warfare down in their stormtrooper tactics. This involved concentrating forces in an attack on a small area of the enemy line to break through and wreak havoc behind said lines, essentially making trench warfare obsolete. And this is where one of the most important figures in German mechanization, Colonel General Hans von Secht, enters the picture. Von Secht put a huge emphasis on maneuver warfare, something that Germany would use to great success in the Second World War, and really got the ball rolling on the concept and its future influence on the German army. Although they now had the doctrine, they still lacked the integral parts to this, the mechanization that would make it all possible. And the key to this was tanks, but there was still a big problem. Under the rules of the Versailles Treaty, Germany was not allowed to possess tanks along with many other tools that would be needed in modern warfare. In response to this, von Seck began implementing workaround programs that would allow the German army to become familiar and experiment with these weapons and their new concepts around the treaty's limitations. This included a program working with the Soviets to develop and test tank designs in Russia, away from the watchful eye of the Allies. Most of the tanks produced during the collaboration with the Soviets, including the Leicht Tractor, were dead ends excluding a few such as the Klein Tractor, which eventually developed into the Panzer I, that brings us to the first generation of German tanks. The Panzer I was developed as a training tank, armed only with machine guns, but due to the relatively short period of time between when Hitler took power in 1933, beginning rearmament, to the beginning of the war in 1939, Panzer I's made up around half of the German tank forces at the very start of the war, along with the Panzer II, that although still a light tank, was upgunned with a 20mm autocannon that made up another good chunk of the German Panzer force. And although our memory of German tanks is made up mostly of large, heavily armored vehicles with big guns, <coughs> These Gen 1 tanks were what made up the backbone of the Panzer Force for most of the early years of success, in a time when most armies that they came up against were fielding heavier, harder-hitting tanks. And on paper, this looks like it should not have worked. But the way that Germany implemented these lighter tanks was what made all the difference. Heinz Guderian, a lower-ranking officer at the time of the development of the Panzer Arm, who had begun his army career in communications, provided Germany with a huge technical leg up against their enemies by insisting that every German tank have a radio in it. So while the French, Polish, and British were still relying on either one-way radios, signal flags, or other antiquated forms of communication, with two-way radios sprinkled around, mostly to command tanks, every German tank commander had a radio to communicate with his superiors and fellow tank commanders, leading to much better coordination that when combined with this maneuver warfare doctrine would quickly overwhelm enemy formations, and this seriously negated the more inferior aspects of these Gen 1 tanks. 
The Gen 1s in the early campaigns were paired with the ever-growing numbers of second-generation German tanks, the Panzer III and the Panzer IV. Developed side-by-side -side in the mid to late 30s, these tanks are really what German commanders had in mind as they experimented with their earlier designs. With the Panzer III being the anti-tank weapon, first armed with the 37mm anti-tank gun in the ALF's A through G variants, and two variations of a 50mm gun, which had always been the goal for the tank to be armed with from the outset, and the ALF's F through M. This tank took advantage of an extremely ergonomic five-man crew with excellent optics for the gunner and vision blocks for the commander. Although appearing in smaller numbers in the campaigns of 1939 through 40, the Panzer III became the workhorse of the German army in Operation Barbarossa and into Fall Blau, with the very latest version, the N, mounting a 75mm gun of the early Panzer IVs once it had been outdated by 1943. The Panzer IV, armed with a short barrel 75mm gun in its early variants, began its life as an infantry support weapon that was later upgunned multiple times with various long barrel 75mm guns, ending the war as the mainstay tank for the German army and being one of only a handful to be in service from the very beginning to the very end of the war. However, for all the successes these tanks had throughout the war, the number of variants I had to list in their descriptions begins to show one of the downsides of the German approach to tank production as a whole. The Germans loved to tinker with their designs and fit in change upon change to a vehicle during its production lifespan. And although this seems fairly benign on the surface, as of course you would want to improve your vehicle as you come up with better ideas, this can create a huge bottleneck in the production capability of your factories. And the Germans are notorious for this multi-model short-run type of production, with every major vehicle that it created being subjected to a long list of changes throughout its lifespan. And this happened with almost every type of vehicle. I'm only covering the main tanks in this video, but assault guns, self-propelled artillery, and tanks alike would have many, many different variants that were created with many of the changes being not very impactful to the overall combat performance of the vehicle. Now I know what comes next is probably what you've been waiting for this whole video, but due to the large amount of information this topic commands, I'm going to go ahead and stop here and get to the Gen 3s in part 2. Because the late war heavies are such a big part of what represents World War II to so many people, I think they deserve their very own video. But I do have one more thing before you go. German tank designers were on their own when it came to coming up with new tank designs, and back then they probably wished they could have had somewhere they could have gone to learn the process instead of having to figure it out all by themselves. They probably would have made great use of something like Skillshare, which offers thousands of classes on a wide range of topics. Okay, maybe none that are how to create a world conquering tank force, but they do provide many helpful classes to kickstart your year. When I first started doing YouTube, I had to learn how to edit starting from scratch and had to mostly rely on YouTube tutorials, hoping the person I found knew what they were talking about, and a lot of them were rather hit or miss, I guess they never miss, huh? Kill yourself. But since then, I have taken several classes on Skillshare, which were extremely helpful in learning how to edit and produce my own videos, so that I am now shitposting on an academic level. And with their help, you can too. Skillshare is less than $10 a month, and if you use my link, you get two free months of premium, giving you unlimited access to high-quality courses by experts in the field. I recently took a course on some of the finer details of editing in Sony Vegas and learned how to use a green screen, and it was extremely helpful. In fact, I'm so sure it'll help you that here's some green screen footage to practice with once you take the course. This? This is what's gonna win you the war. I don't know, man. I don't... I don't really get the draw. Do your worst. So sign up for Skillshare today, and don't forget to use my link for two free months of premium, and I look forward to seeing your academic level shitposts in the future. I'd like to thank all my patrons on Patreon for their generosity in keeping this series going. We're about halfway through all the countries I want to cover, and it's been one of my favorites to do so far. On the next one, we'll be taking a look at American tanks, so keep your eye out for that. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next week.